Chapter One of The Real Thing by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford. The Real Thing by Henry James. Chapter One. When the porter's wife, she used to answer the house bell, announced, A gentleman with a lady, sir, I had, as I often had in those days, for the wish was father to the thought, an immediate vision of sitters. Sitters my visitors in this case proved to be, but not in the sense I should have preferred. However, there was nothing at first to indicate that they might not have come for a portrait. The gentleman, a man of fifty, very high and very straight, with a moustache slightly grizzled, and a dark grey walking-coat admirably fitted, both of which I noted professionally, I don't mean as a barber, or yet as a tailor, would have struck me as a celebrity if celebrities often were striking. It was a truth of which I had for some time been conscious, that a figure with a good deal of frontage was, as one might say, almost never a public institution. A glance at the lady helped to remind me of this paradoxical law. She also looked too distinguished to be a personality. Moreover, one would scarcely come across two variations together. Neither of the pair spoke immediately. They only prolonged the preliminary gaze which suggested that each wished to give the other a chance. They were visibly shy. They stood there letting me take them in, which, as I afterwards perceived, was the most practical thing they could have done. In this way their embarrassment served their cause. I had seen people painfully reluctant to mention that they desired anything so gross as to be represented on canvas, but the scruples of my new friends appeared almost insurmountable. Yet the gentleman might have said, I should like a portrait of my wife, and the lady might have said, I should like a portrait of my husband. Perhaps they were not husband and wife. This naturally would make the matter more delicate. Perhaps they wished to be done together, in which case they ought to have brought a third person to break the news. "'We come from Mr. Rivet,' the lady said at last, with a dim smile, which had the effect of a moist sponge passed over a sunk piece of painting, as well as of a vague allusion to vanished beauty. She was as tall and straight in her degree as her companion, and with ten years less to carry. She looked as sad as a woman could look whose face was not charged with expression. That is, her tinted oval mask showed friction as an exposed surface shows it. The hand of time had played over her freely, but only to simplify. She was slim and stiff, and so well dressed in dark blue cloth, with lappets and pockets and buttons, that it was clear she employed the same tailor as her husband. The couple had an indefinable air of prosperous thrift. They evidently got a good deal of luxury for their money. If I was to be one of their luxuries, it would behoove me to consider my terms. "'Ah, Claude Rivet recommended me,' I inquired, and I added that it was very kind of him, though I could reflect that, as he only painted landscape, this was not a sacrifice. The lady looked very hard at the gentleman, and the gentleman looked round the room. Then, staring at the floor a moment and stroking his moustache, he rested his pleasant eyes on me with the remark, "'He said you were the right one.' "'I try to be when people want to sit.' "'Yes, we should like to,' said the lady anxiously. "'Do you mean together?' My visitors exchanged a glance. "'If you could do anything with me, I suppose it would be double,' the gentleman stammered. "'Oh, yes, there's naturally a higher charge for two figures than for one.' "'We should like to make it pay,' the husband confessed. "'That's very good of you,' I returned, appreciating so unwanted a sympathy, for I supposed he meant pay the artist. A sense of strangeness seemed to dawn on the lady. "'We meant for the illustrations. Mr. Rivet said you might put one in.' "'Put one in? An illustration?' I was equally confused. "'Sketch her off, you know,' said the gentleman, colouring. It was only then that I understood the service Claude Rivet had rendered me. 
He had told them that I worked in black and white, for magazines, for story-books, for sketches of contemporary life, and consequently had frequent employment for models. These things were true, but it was not less true, I may confess it now, whether because the aspiration was to lead to everything or to nothing I leave the reader to guess, that I couldn't get the honours, to say nothing of the emoluments, of a great painter of portraits out of my head. My illustrations were my pot-boilers. I looked to a different branch of art, far and away the most interesting it had always seemed to me, to perpetuate my fame. There was no shame in looking to it also to make my fortune, but that fortune was by so much further from being made from the moment my visitors wished to be done for nothing. I was disappointed, for in the pictorial sense I had immediately seen them. I had seized their type, I had already settled what I would do with it. Something that wouldn't absolutely have pleased them, I afterwards reflected. Ah, you're a, you're a, I began, as soon as I had mastered my surprise. I couldn't bring out the dingy word models. It seemed to fit the case so little. We haven't had much practice, said the lady. We've got to do something, and we thought that an artist in your line might perhaps make something of us, her husband threw off. He further mentioned that they didn't know many artists, and that they had gone first on the off chance. He painted views, of course, but sometimes put in figures, perhaps I remembered. To Mr. Rivet, whom they had met a few years before at a place in Norfolk where he was sketching. We used to sketch a little ourselves, the lady hinted. It's very awkward, but we absolutely must do something, her husband went on. Of course we're not so very young, she admitted with a wan smile. With the remark that I might as well know something more about them, the husband had handed me a card extracted from a neat new pocket-book, their appurtenances were all of the freshest, and inscribed with the words, Major Monarch. Impressive as these words were, they didn't carry my knowledge much further, but my visitor presently added, I've left the army, and we've had the misfortune to lose our money. In fact, our means are dreadfully small. It's an awful bore, said Mrs. Monarch. They evidently wished to be discreet, to take care not to swagger because they were gentlefolks. I perceived that they would have been willing to recognize this as something of a drawback, at the same time that I guessed at an underlying sense, their consolation in adversity, that they had their points. They certainly had, but these advantages struck me as preponderantly social, such, for instance, as would help to make a drawing-room look well. However, a drawing-room was always, or ought to be, a picture. In consequence of his wife's allusion to their age, Major Monarch observed, Naturally, it's more for the figure that we thought of going in. We can still hold ourselves up. On the instant I saw that the figure was indeed their strong point. His naturally didn't sound vain, but it lighted up the question. She has got the best, he continued, nodding at his wife with a pleasant after-dinner absence of circumlocution. I could only reply, as if we were in fact sitting over our wine, that this didn't prevent his own from being very good, which led him in turn to rejoin, We thought that if you ever have to do people like us, we might be something like it, she particularly, for a lady in a book, you know. I was so amused by them, that to get more of it, I did my best to take their point of view, and though it was an embarrassment to find myself appraising physically, as if they were animals on hire or useful blacks, a pair whom I should have expected to meet only in one of the relations in which criticism is tacit, I looked at Mrs. Monarch judicially enough to be able to exclaim, after a moment, with conviction, "'Oh, yes, a lady in a book!' She was singularly like a bad illustration. "'We'll stand up, if you like,' said the Major, and he raised himself before me with a really grand air. I could take his measure at a glance. He was six feet two and a perfect gentleman. It would have paid any club in process of formation and in want of a stamp to engage him at a salary to stand in the principal window. What struck me immediately was that in coming to me they had rather missed their vocation.' 
they could surely have been turned to better account for advertising purposes. I couldn't, of course, see the thing in detail, but I could see them make someone's fortune. I don't mean their own. There was something in them for a waistcoat-maker, an hotel-keeper, or a soap-vendor. I could imagine we always use it, pinned on their bosoms with the greatest effect. I had a vision of the promptitude with which they would launch a table d'hôte. Mrs. Monarch sat still, not from pride but from shyness, and presently her husband said to her, "'Get up, my dear, and show how smart you are.' She obeyed, but she had no need to get up to show it. She walked to the end of the studio, and then she came back blushing with her fluttered eyes on her husband. I was reminded of an incident I had accidentally had a glimpse of in Paris, being with a friend there, a dramatist about to produce a play, when an actress came to him to ask to be entrusted with a part. She went through her paces before him, walked up and down as Mrs. Monarch was doing. Mrs. Monarch did it quite as well, but I abstained from applauding. It was very odd to see such people apply for such poor pay. She looked as if she had ten thousand a year. Her husband had used the word that described her. She was, in the London current jargon, essentially and typically smart. Her figure was, in the same order of ideas, conspicuously and irreproachably good. For a woman of her age her waist was surprisingly small. Her elbow, moreover, had the orthodox crook. She held up her head at the conventional angle. But why did she come to me? She ought to have tried on jackets at a big shop. I feared my visitors were not only destitute, but artistic, which would be a great complication. When she sat down again I thanked her, observing that what a draftsman most valued in his model was the faculty of keeping quiet. "'Oh, she can keep quiet,' said Major Monarch. Then he added, jocosely, "'I've always kept her quiet.' "'I'm not a nasty fidget, am I?' Mrs. Monarch appealed to her husband. He addressed his answer to me. "'Perhaps it isn't out of place to mention, because we ought to be quite businesslike, oughtn't we, that when I married her she was known as the beautiful statue.' "'Oh, dear,' said Mrs. Monarch, ruefully. "'Of course I should want a certain amount of expression,' I rejoined. "'Of course!' they both exclaimed. "'And then I suppose you know you'll get awfully tired.' "'Oh, we never get tired!' they eagerly cried. "'Have you had any kind of practice?' They hesitated. They looked at each other. "'We've been photographed immensely,' said Mrs. Monarch. "'She means the fellows have asked us,' added the Major. I see, because you're so good-looking. I don't know what they thought, but they were always after us. We always got our photographs for nothing, smiled Mrs. Monarch. We might have brought some, my dear, her husband remarked. I'm not sure we have any left. We've given quantities away, she explained to me. With our autographs and that sort of thing, said the Major. Are they to be got in the shops, I inquired, as a harmless pleasantry? Oh, yes, hers, they used to be. Not now, said Mrs. Monarch, with her eyes on the floor. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Real Thing by Henry James This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I could fancy the sort of thing they put on the presentation copies of their photographs, and I was sure they wrote a beautiful hand. It was odd how quickly I was sure of everything that concerned them. If they were now so poor as to have to earn shillings and pence, they never had had much of a margin. Their good looks had been their capital, and they had good-humouredly made the most of the career that this resource marked out for them. It was in their faces, the blankness, the deep intellectual repose of the twenty years of country-house visiting which had given them pleasant intonations. I could see the sunny drawing-rooms, sprinkled with periodicals she didn't read, in which Mrs. Monarch had continuously sat. I could see the wet shrubberies in which she had walked, equipped to admiration for either exercise. I could see the rich covers the Major had helped to shoot, and the wonderful garments in which, late at night, 
he repaired to the smoking-room to talk about them. I could imagine their leggings and waterproofs, their knowing tweeds and rugs, their rolls of sticks and cases of tackle and neat umbrellas, and I could evoke the exact appearance of their servants and the compact variety of their luggage on the platforms of country stations. They gave small tips, but they were liked. They didn't do anything themselves, but they were welcome. They looked so well everywhere, they gratified the general relish for stature, complexion, and form. They knew it without fatuity or vulgarity, and they respected themselves in consequence. They were not superficial, they were thorough and kept themselves up. It had been their line. People with such a taste for activity had to have some line. I could feel how, even in a dull house, they would have been counted upon for cheerfulness. At present, something had happened. It didn't matter what, their little income had grown less, it had grown least, and they had to do something for pocket money. Their friends liked them, but didn't like to support them. There was something about them that represented credit, their clothes, their manners, their type. But if credit is a large empty pocket in which an occasional chink reverberates, the chink at least must be audible. What they wanted of me was to help to make it so. Fortunately, they had no children. I soon divined that. They would also perhaps wish our relations to be kept secret. This was why it was, for the figure, the reproduction of the face would betray them. I liked them. They were so simple, and I had no objection to them if they would suit. But somehow, with all their perfections, I didn't easily believe in them. After all, they were amateurs, and the ruling passion of my life was the detestation of the amateur. Combined with this was another perversity, an innate preference for the represented subject over the real one. The defect of the real one was so apt to be a lack of representation. I liked things that appeared, then one was sure. Whether they were or not was a subordinate and almost always a profitless question. There were other considerations, the first of which was that I had already had two or three people in use, notably a young person with big feet in alpaca from Kilburn, who for a couple of years had come to me regularly for my illustrations, and with whom I was still, perhaps ignobly, satisfied. I frankly explained to my visitors how the case stood, but they had taken more precautions than I supposed. They had reasoned out their opportunity, for Claude Rivet had told them of the projected edition de luxe of one of the writers of our day, the rarest of the novelists, who, long neglected by the multitudinous vulgar, and dearly prized by the attentive, need I mention Philip Vincent, had had the happy fortune of seeing, late in life, the dawn and then the full light of a higher criticism, an estimate in which, on the part of the public, there was something really of expiation. The edition in question, planned by a publisher of taste, was practically an act of high reparation. The woodcuts with which it was to be enriched were the homage of English art to one of the most independent representatives of English letters. Major and Mrs. Monarch confessed to me that they had hoped I might be able to work them into my share of the enterprise. They knew I was to do the first of the books, Rutland Ramsay, but I had to make clear to them that my participation in the rest of the affair, the first book was to be a test, was to depend on the satisfaction I should give. If this should be limited, my employers would drop me without a scruple. It was therefore a crisis for me, and naturally I was making special preparations, looking about for new people if they should be necessary, and securing the best types. I admitted, however, that I should like to settle down to two or three good models who would do for everything. "'Should we have often to, uh, put on special clothes?' Mrs. Monarch timidly demanded. "'Dear, yes, that's half the business. And should we be expected to supply our own costumes?' "'Oh, no, I've got a lot of things. A painter's models put on or put off anything he likes.' "'And do you mean, uh, the same?' "'The same?' Mrs. Monarch looked at her husband again. "'Oh, she was just wondering,' he explained, "'if the costumes are in general use.' I had to confess that they were, and I mentioned further that some of them, 
I had a lot of genuine, greasy last-century things that served their time a hundred years ago on living, world-stained men and women. We'll put on anything that fits, said the Major. Oh, I arrange that. They fit in the pictures. I'm afraid I should do better for the modern books. I would come as you like, said Mrs. Monarch. She has got a lot of clothes at home. They might do for contemporary life, her husband continued. Oh, I can fancy scenes in which you'd be quite natural. And indeed I could see the slipshod rearrangements of stale properties, the stories I tried to produce pictures for without the exasperation of reading them, whose sandy tracts the good lady might help to people. But I had to return to the fact that for this sort of work, the daily mechanical grind, I was already equipped. The people I was working with were fully adequate. We only thought we might be more like some characters, said Mrs. Monarch mildly, getting up. Her husband also rose. He stood looking at me with a dim wistfulness that was touching in so fine a man. Wouldn't it be rather a pull sometimes to have a... Uh, to have... He hung fire. He wanted me to help him by phrasing what he meant. But I couldn't. I didn't know. So he brought it out awkwardly. The real thing, a gentleman, you know, or a lady. I was quite ready to give a general assent. I admitted that there was a great deal in that. This encouraged Major Monarch to say, following up his appeal with an unacted gulp. It's awfully hard. We've tried everything. The gulp was communicative. It proved too much for his wife. Before I knew it, Mrs. Monarch had dropped again upon a divan and burst into tears. Her husband sat down beside her, holding one of her hands, whereupon she quickly dried her eyes with the other, while I felt embarrassed as she looked up at me. There isn't a confounded job I haven't applied for, waited for, prayed for. You can fancy we'd be pretty bad first. Secretaryships and that sort of thing? You might as well ask for a peerage. I'd be anything. I'm strong. A messenger or a coal-heaver. I'd put on a gold-laced cap and open carriage doors in front of the haberdashers. I'd hang about a station to carry portmanteaus. I'd be a postman. But they won't look at you. There are thousands as good as yourself already on the ground. Gentlemen, poor beggars, who have drunk their wine, who have kept their hunters. I was as reassuring as I knew how to be, and my visitors were presently on their feet again, while, for the experiment we agreed on an hour. We were discussing it when the door opened, and Miss Cherm came in with a wet umbrella. Miss Cherm had to take the omnibus to Maida Vale, and then walk half a mile. She looked a trifle blousy and slightly splashed. I scarcely ever saw her come in without thinking afresh how odd it was that, being so little in herself, she should yet be so much in others. She was a meagre little Miss Cherm, but she was an ample heroine of romance. She was only a freckled cockney, but she could represent everything, from a fine lady to a shepherdess. She had the faculty, as she might have had a fine voice or long hair. She couldn't spell, and she loved beer, but she had two or three points, and practice, and a knack, and mother wit, and a kind of whimsical sensibility, and a love of the theatre, and seven sisters, and not an ounce of respect, especially for the H. The first thing my visitors saw was that her umbrella was wet, and in their spotless perfection they visibly winced at it. The rain had come on since their arrival. "'I'm all in a soak. There was a mess of people on the bus. I wished you lived near a station,' said Miss Cherm. I requested her to get ready as quickly as possible and she passed into the room in which she always changed her dress. But before going out she asked me what she was going to get into this time. "'It's the Russian princess, don't you know?' I answered, the one with the golden eyes and black velvet, for the long thing in the cheap side. "'Golden eyes! I say!' cried Miss Cherm, while my companions watched her with intensity as she withdrew. She always arranged herself, when she was late, before I could turn round, and I kept my visitors a little on purpose, so that they might get an idea, from seeing her, what would be expected of themselves. I mentioned that she was quite my notion of an excellent model. She was really very clever. 
"'Do you think she looks like a Russian princess?' Major Monarch asked, with lurking alarm. "'When I make her, yes.' "'Oh, if you have to make her,' he reasoned acutely. "'That's the most you can ask. There are so many that are not makeable.' "'Well, now, here's a lady,' and with a persuasive smile he passed his arm into his wife's, who's already made. "'Oh, I'm not a Russian princess,' Mrs. Monarch protested, a little coldly. I could see that she had known some and didn't like them. There, immediately, was a complication of a kind that I had never had to fear with Miss Cherm. This young lady came back in black velvet. The gown was rather rusty and very low on her lean shoulders, and with a Japanese fan in her red hands. I reminded her that in the scene I was doing she had to look over someone's head. I forget who it is, but it doesn't matter. Just look over a head. "'I'd rather look over a stove,' said Miss Cherm, and she took her station near the fire. She fell into position, settled herself into a tall attitude, gave a certain backward inclination to her head and a certain forward droop to her fan, and looked, at least to my prejudiced sense, distinguished and charming, foreign and dangerous. We left her looking so while I went downstairs with Major and Mrs. Monarch. "'I think I could come about as near it as that,' said Mrs. Monarch. "'Oh, you think she's shabby, but you must allow for the alchemy of art.' However, they went off with an evident increase of comfort, founded on their demonstrable advantage in being the real thing. I could fancy them shuddering over Miss Cherm. She was very droll about them when I went back, for I told her what they wanted. "'Well, if she can sit, I'll take the bookkeeping,' said my model. "'She's very ladylike,' I replied, as an innocent form of aggravation. "'So much the worse for you. That means she can't turn round. She'll do for the fashionable novels.' "'Oh, yes, she'll do for them,' my model humorously declared. "'Ain't they had enough without her?' I had often sociably denounced them to Miss Cherm. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Real Thing by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was for the elucidation of a mystery in one of these works that I first tried Mrs. Monarch. Her husband came with her, to be useful if necessary. It was sufficiently clear that as a general thing he would prefer to come with her. At first I wondered if this were for propriety's sake, if he were going to be jealous and meddling. The idea was too tiresome and if it had been confirmed it would speedily have brought our acquaintance to a close. But I soon saw there was nothing in it, and that if he had accompanied Mrs. Monarch it was, in addition to the chance of being wanted, simply because he had nothing else to do. When she was away from him his occupation was gone. She had never been away from him. I judged rightly that in their awkward situation their close union was their main comfort, and that this union had no weak spot. It was a real marriage, an encouragement to the hesitating, a nut for pessimists to crack. Their address was humble. I remember afterwards thinking it had been the only thing about them that was really professional, and I could fancy the lamentable lodgings in which the Major would have been left alone. He could bear them with his wife. He couldn't bear them without her. He had too much tact to try to make himself agreeable when he couldn't be useful, so he simply sat and waited when I was too absorbed in my work to talk. But I liked to make him talk. It made my work, when it didn't interrupt it, less sordid, less special. To listen to him was to combine the excitement of going out with the economy of staying at home. There was only one hindrance, that I seemed not to know any of the people he and his wife had known. I think he wondered extremely during the term of our intercourse whom the deuce I did know. He hadn't a stray sixpence of an idea to fumble for, so we didn't spin it very fine. We confined ourselves to questions of leather, and even of liquor, saddlers and breeches makers, and how to get good claret cheap, and matters like good trains and the habits of small game. His lore on these last subjects was astonishing. He managed to interweave the station-master with the ornithologist. When he couldn't talk about greater things, he could talk cheerfully about smaller. 
and since I couldn't accompany him into reminiscences of the fashionable world, he could lower the conversation without a visible effort to my level. So earnest a desire to please was touching in a man who could so easily have knocked one down. He looked after the fire, and had an opinion on the draught of the stove, without my asking him, and I could see that he thought many of my arrangements not half clever enough. I remember telling him that if I were only rich, I would offer him a salary to come and teach me how to live. Sometimes he gave a random sigh, of which the essence was, Give me even such a bare old barrack as this, and I'd do something with it. When I wanted to use him, he came alone, which was an illustration of the superior courage of women. His wife could bear her solitary second floor, and she was in general more discreet, showing by various small reserves that she was alive to the propriety of keeping our relations markedly professional, not letting them slide into sociability. She wished it to remain clear that she and the Major were employed, not cultivated, and if she approved of me as a superior, who could be kept in his place, she never thought me quite good enough for an equal. She sat with great intensity, giving the whole of her mind to it, and was capable of remaining for an hour almost as motionless as if she were before a photographer's lens. I could see she had been photographed often but somehow the very habit that made her good for that purpose unfitted her for mine. At first I was extremely pleased with her ladylike air, and it was a satisfaction, on coming to follow her lines, to see how good they were, and how far they could lead the pencil. But after a few times I began to find her too insurmountably stiff. Do what I would with it, my drawing looked like a photograph, or a copy of a photograph. Her figure had no variety of expression. She herself had no sense of variety. You may say that this was my business, was only a question of placing her. I placed her in every conceivable position, but she managed to obliterate their differences. She was always a lady, certainly, and into the bargain was always the same lady. She was the real thing, but always the same thing. There were moments when I was oppressed by the serenity of her confidence that she was the real thing. All her dealings with me and all her husband's were an implication that this was lucky for me. Meanwhile I found myself trying to invent types that approached her own, instead of making her own transform itself, in the clever way that was not impossible, for instance, to poor Miss Cherm. Arrange as I would, and take the precautions I would, she always, and my pictures came out too tall, landing me in the dilemma of having represented a fascinating woman as seven feet high, which out of respect perhaps to my own very much scantier inches, was far from my idea of such a personage. The case was worse with the Major. Nothing I could do would keep him down, so that he became useful only for the representation of brawny giants. I adored variety and range. I cherished human accidents, the illustrative note. I wanted to characterize closely, and the thing in the world I most hated was the danger of being ridden by a type. I had quarreled with some of my friends about it. I had parted company with them for maintaining that one had to be, and that if the type was beautiful, witness Raphael and Leonardo, the servitude was only a gain. I was neither Leonardo nor Raphael. I might only be a presumptuous young modern searcher, but I held that everything was to be sacrificed sooner than character. When they averred that the haunting type in question could easily be character, I retorted, perhaps superficially, whose? It couldn't be everybody's. It might end in being nobody's. After I had drawn Mrs. Monarch a dozen times, I perceived more clearly than before that the value of such a model as Miss Cherm resided precisely in the fact that she had no positive stamp, combined, of course, with the other fact that what she did have was a curious and inexplicable talent for imitation. Her usual appearance was like a curtain which she could draw up at request for a capital performance. This performance was simply suggestive, but it was a word to the wise. It was vivid and pretty. Sometimes even I thought it, though she was plain herself, too insipidly pretty, 
I made it a reproach to her that the figures drawn from her were monotonously, bêtement, as we used to say, graceful. Nothing made her more angry. It was so much her pride to feel that she could sit for characters that had nothing in common with each other. She would accuse me at such moments of taking away her reputation. It suffered a certain shrinkage, this queer quantity, from the repeated visits of my new friends. Miss Churm was greatly in demand, never in want of employment, so I had no scruple in putting her off occasionally to try them more at my ease. It was certainly amusing at first to do the real thing. It was amusing to do Major Monarch's trousers. They were the real thing, even if he did come out colossal. It was amusing to do his wife's back hair. It was so mathematically neat, and the particular smart tension of her tight stays. She let herself especially to positions in which the face was somewhat averted or blurred. She abounded in ladylike back views and profil perdu. When she stood erect, she took naturally one of the attitudes in which court painters represent queens and princesses, so that I found myself wondering whether, to draw out this accomplishment, I couldn't get the editor of the cheap side to publish a really royal romance, A Tale of Buckingham Palace. Sometimes, however, the real thing in the make-believe came into contact, by which I mean that Miss Churm, keeping an appointment or coming to make one on days when I had much work in hand, encountered her invidious rivals. The encounter was not on their part, for they noticed her no more than if she had been the housemaid, not from intentional loftiness, but simply because, as yet, professionally, they didn't know how to fraternize, as I could guess they would have liked, or at least that the Major would. They couldn't talk about the omnibus, they always walked, and they didn't know what else to try. She wasn't interested in good trains or cheap claret. Besides, they must have felt, in the air, that she was amused at them, secretly derisive of their ever knowing how. She was not a person to conceal her scepticism if she had a chance to show it. On the other hand, Mrs. Monarch didn't think her tidy. For why else did she take pains to say to me, it was going out of the way for Mrs. Monarch, that she didn't like dirty women? One day, when my young lady happened to be present with my other sitters, she even dropped in when it was convenient for a chat, I asked her to be so good as to lend a hand in getting tea, a service with which she was familiar, and which was one of a class that, living as I did in a small way, with slender domestic resources, I often appealed to my models to render. They liked to lay hands on my property, to break the sitting, and sometimes the china. I made them feel bohemian. The next time I saw Miss Cherm after this incident, she surprised me greatly by making a scene about it. She accused me of having wished to humiliate her. She had not resented the outrage at the time, but had seemed obliging and amused, enjoying the comedy of asking Mrs. Monarch, who sat vague and silent, whether she would have cream and sugar, and putting an exaggerated simper into the question. She had tried intonations, as if she too wished to pass for the real thing, till I was afraid my other visitors would take offence. Oh, they were determined not to do this, and their touching patience was the measure of their great need. They would sit by the hour, uncomplaining, till I was ready to use them. They would come back on the chance of being wanted, and would walk away cheerfully if they were not. I used to go to the door with them, to see in what magnificent order they retreated. I tried to find other employment for them. I introduced them to several artists. But they didn't take, for reasons I could appreciate, and I became conscious, rather anxiously, that after such disappointments they fell back upon me with a heavier weight. They did me the honour to think that it was I who was most their form. They were not picturesque enough for the painters, and in those days there were not so many serious workers in black and white. Besides, they had an eye to the great job I had mentioned to them. They had secretly set their hearts on supplying the right essence for my pictorial vindication of our fine novelist. They knew that for this undertaking I should want no costume effects, none of the frippery of past ages, that it was a case in which everything would be contemporary and satirical and presumably genteel. If I could work them into it, their future would be assured, 
for the labour would of course be long, and the occupation steady. One day Mrs. Bonnet came without her husband. She explained his absence by his having had to go to the city. While she sat there in her usual anxious stiffness there came, at the door, a knock which I immediately recognized as the subdued appeal of a model out of work. It was followed by the entrance of a young man whom I easily perceived to be a foreigner, and who proved, in fact, an Italian acquainted with no English word but my name, which he uttered in a way that made it seem to include all others. I had not then visited his country, nor was I proficient in his tongue, but as he was not so meanly constituted, what Italian is, as to depend only on that member for expression, he conveyed to me, in familiar but graceful mimicry, that he was in search of exactly the employment in which the lady before me was engaged. I was not struck with him at first, and while I continued to draw I emitted rough sounds of discouragement and dismissal. He stood his ground, however, not importunately, but with a dumb, dog-like fidelity in his eyes which amounted to innocent impudence, the manner of a devoted servant he might have been in the house for years, unjustly suspected. Suddenly I saw that this very attitude and expression made a picture, whereupon I told him to sit down and wait till I should be free. There was another picture in the way he obeyed me, and I observed as I worked that there were others still in the way he looked wonderingly, with his head thrown back, about the high studio. He might have been crossing himself in St. Peter's. Before I finished, I said to myself, the fellow's a bankrupt orange-monger, but he's a treasure. When Mrs. Monarch withdrew, he passed across the room like a flash to open the door for her, standing there with the rapt, pure gaze of the young Dante spellbound by the young Beatrice. As I never insisted in such situations on the blankness of the British domestic, I reflected that he had the making of a servant, and I needed one, but couldn't pay him to be only that, as well as of a model. In short, I made up my mind to adopt my bright adventurer, if he would agree to officiate in the double capacity. He jumped at my offer, and in the event my rashness, for I had known nothing about him, was not brought home to me. He proved a sympathetic, though a desultory, ministrant, and had, in a wonderful degree, the sentiment de la pose. It was uncultivated, instinctive, a part of the happy instinct which had guided him to my door, and helped him to spell out my name on the card nailed to it. He had had no other introduction to me than a guess, from the shape of my high north window, seen outside, that my place was a studio, and that as a studio it would contain an artist. He had wandered to England in search of fortune, like other itinerants, and had embarked with a partner and a small green handcart on the sale of penny ices. The ices had melted away, and the partner had dissolved in their train. My young man wore tight yellow trousers with reddish stripes, and his name was Oronte. He was sallow but fair, and when I put him into some old clothes of my own, he looked like an Englishman. He was as good as Miss Cherm, who could look, when required, like an Italian. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Real Thing by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I thought Mrs. Monarch's face slightly convulsed when, on her coming back with her husband, she found Orante installed. It was strange to have to recognize in a scrap of a lazzarone a competitor to her magnificent major. It was she who scented danger first, for the major was anecdotically unconscious. But Arante gave us tea with a hundred eager confusions. He had never seen such a queer process, and I think she thought better of me for having at last an establishment. They saw a couple of drawings that I had made of the establishment, and Mrs. Monarch hinted that it would never have struck her that he had sat for them. Now the drawings you make from us, they look exactly like us, she reminded me, smiling in triumph, and I recognized that this was indeed just their defect. When I drew the monarchs, I couldn't somehow get away from them, get into the character I wanted to represent, and I had not the least desire my model should be discoverable in my picture. 
Miss Germ never was, and Mrs. Monarch thought I hid her very properly, because she was vulgar, whereas if she was lost it was only as the dead who go to heaven are lost, in the gain of an angel the more. By this time I had got a certain start with Rutland Ramsay, the first novel in the great projected series. That is, I had produced a dozen drawings, several with the help of the Major and his wife, and I had sent them in for approval. My understanding with the publishers, as I have already hinted, had been that I was left to do my work in this particular case as I liked, with the whole book committed to me, but my connection with the rest of the series was only contingent. There were moments when, frankly, it was a comfort to have the real thing under one's hand, for there were characters in Rutland Ramsay that were very much like it. There were people presumably as straight as the Major, and women of as good a fashion as Mrs. Monarch. There was a great deal of country-house life, treated, it is true, in a fine, fanciful, ironical, generalized way, and there was a considerable implication of knickerbockers and kilts. There were certain things I had to settle at the outset, such things, for instance, as the exact appearance of the hero, the particular bloom of the heroine. The author, of course, gave me a lead, but there was a margin for interpretation. I took the monarchs into my confidence. I told them frankly what I was about. I mentioned my embarrassments and alternatives. Oh, take him, Mrs. Monarch murmured sweetly, looking at her husband, and what could you want better than my wife? the major inquired, with the comfortable candor that now prevailed between us. I was not obliged to answer these remarks. I was only obliged to place my sitters. I was not easy in mind, and I postponed, a little timidly perhaps, the solution of the question. The book was a large canvas, the other figures were numerous, and I worked off at first some of the episodes in which the hero and the heroine were not concerned. When once I had set them up, I should have to stick to them. I couldn't make my young man seven feet high in one place, and five feet nine in another. I inclined not the whole to the latter measurement, though the Major more than once reminded me that he looked about as young as any one. It was indeed quite possible to arrange him, for the figure, so that it would have been difficult to detect his age. After the spontaneous Oronte had been with me a month, and after I had given him to understand several different times that his native exuberance would presently constitute an insurmountable barrier to our further intercourse, I waked to a sense of his heroic capacity. He was only five feet seven, but the remaining inches were latent. I tried him almost secretly at first, for I was really rather afraid of the judgment my other models would pass on such a choice. If they regarded Miss Cherm as little better than a snare, what would they think of the representation by a person so little the real thing as an Italian street vendor of a protagonist formed by a public school? If I went a little in fear of them, it was not because they bullied me, because they had got an oppressive foothold, but because in their really pathetic decorum and mysteriously permanent newness they counted on me so intensely. I was therefore very glad when Jack Hawley came home. He was always of such good counsel. He painted badly himself, but there was no one like him for putting his finger on the place. He had been absent from England for a year. He'd been somewhere, I don't remember where, to get a fresh eye. I was in a good deal of dread of any such organ, but we were old friends. He had been away for months, and a sense of emptiness was creeping into my life. I hadn't dodged a missile for a year. He came back with a fresh eye, but with the same old black velvet blouse, and the first evening he spent in my studio we smoked cigarettes till the small hours. He had done no work himself. He had only got the eye, so the field was clear for the production of my little things. He wanted to see what I had done for the cheap side, but he was disappointed in the exhibition. That at least seemed the meaning of two or three comprehensive groans, which, as he lounged on my big divan, on a folded leg, looking at my latest drawings, issued from his lips with the smoke of the cigarette. "'What's the matter with you?' I asked. "'What's the matter with you?' "'Nothing, save that I'm mystified.' "'You are indeed. You're quite off the hinge. What's the meaning of this new fad?' And he tossed me, with visible irreverence, a drawing in which I happened to have depicted both my majestic models. 
I asked him if he didn't think it good, and he replied that it struck him as execrable, given the sort of thing I had always represented myself to him as wishing to arrive at. But I let it pass. I was so anxious to see exactly what he meant. The two figures in the picture looked colossal, but I supposed this was not what he meant, inasmuch as, for aught he knew to the contrary, I might have been trying for that. I maintained that I was working exactly in the same way as when he had last done me the honour to commend me. "'Well, there's a big hole somewhere,' he answered. "'Wait a bit, and I'll discover it.' I depended upon him to do so. Where else was the fresh eye? But he produced at last nothing more luminous than, "'I don't know. I don't like your types.' This was lame, for a critic who had never consented to discuss with me anything but the question of execution, the direction of strokes, and the mystery of values. "'In the drawings you've been looking at, I think my types are very handsome.' "'Oh, they won't do.' "'I've had a couple of new models.' "'I see you have. They won't do.' "'Are you very sure of that?' "'Absolutely. They're stupid.' "'You mean I am, for I ought to get round that.' You can't with such people. Who are they? I told him as far as was necessary, and he declared heartlessly, Ce sont des gens qu'il faut mettre à la porte. You've never seen them. They're awfully good, I compassionately objected. Not seen them? Why, all this recent work of yours drops to pieces with them. It's all I want to see of them. No one else has said anything against it. The cheap side people are pleased. Everyone else is an ass, and the Cheapside people the biggest asses of all. Come, don't pretend at this time of day to have pretty illusions about the public, especially about publishers and editors. It's not for such animals you work. It's for those who know, coloro che sanno. So keep straight for me, if you can't keep straight for yourself. There's a certain sort of thing you tried for from the first, and a very good thing it is. But this twaddle isn't in it. When I talked with Hawley later about Rutland Ramsay and its possible successors, he declared that I must get back into my boat again, or I would go to the bottom. His voice, in short, was the voice of warning. I noted the warning, but I didn't turn my friends out of doors. They bored me a good deal. But the very fact that they bored me admonished me not to sacrifice them, as if there was anything to be done with them, simply to irritation. As I look back at this phase, they seem to me to have pervaded my life not a little. I have a vision of them, as most of the time in my studio, seated against the wall on an old velvet bench to be out of the way, and looking like a pair of patient courtiers in a royal antechamber. I am convinced that during the coldest weeks of the winter they held their ground because it saved them fire. Their newness was losing its gloss, and it was impossible not to feel that they were objects of charity. Whenever Miss Cherm arrived, they went away, and after I was fairly launched in Rutland Ramsay, Miss Cherm arrived pretty often. They managed to express to me tacitly that they supposed I wanted her for the low life of the book, and I let them suppose it, since they had attempted to study the work. It was lying about the studio, without discovering that it dealt only with the highest circles. They had dipped into the most brilliant of our novelists, without deciphering many passages. I still took an hour from them, now and again, in spite of Jack Hawley's warning. It would be time enough to dismiss them, if dismissal should be necessary, when the rigour of the season was over. Hawley had made their acquaintance, he had met them at my fireside, and thought them a ridiculous pair. Learning that he was a painter, they tried to approach him, to show him, too, that they were the real thing. But he looked at them, across the big room, as if they were miles away. They were a compendium of everything that he most objected to in the social system of his country. Such people as that, all convention and patent leather, with ejaculations that stopped conversation, had no business in a studio. A studio was a place to learn to see, and how could you see through a pair of feather beds? The main inconvenience I suffered at their hands was that, at first, I was shy of letting them discover how my artful little servant had begun to sit to be for Rutland Ramsay. They knew that I had been odd enough. They were prepared by this time to allow oddity to artists, 
to pick a foreign vagabond out of the streets, when I might have had a person with whiskers and credentials, but it was some time before they learned how high I rated his accomplishments. They found in him an attitude more than once, but they never doubted that I was doing him as an organ-grinder. There were several things they never guessed, and one of them was that for a striking scene in the novel, in which a footman briefly figured, it occurred to me to make use of Major Monarch as the menial. I kept putting this off. I didn't like to ask him to don the livery, besides the difficulty of finding a livery to fit him. At last, one day late in the winter, when I was at work on the despised Orante, he caught one's idea in an instant, and was in the glow of feeling that I was going very straight, they came in, the Major and his wife, with their society laugh about nothing. There was less and less to laugh at. Like country callers, they always reminded me of that, who have walked across the park after church, and are presently persuaded to stay to luncheon. Luncheon was over, but they could stay to tea. I knew they wanted it. The fit was on me, however, and I couldn't let my ardour cool and my work wait with the fading daylight while my model prepared it. So I asked Mrs. Monarch if she would mind laying it out, a request which for an instant brought all the blood to her face. Her eyes were on her husband's for a second, and some mute telegraphy passed between them. Their folly was over the next instant, his cheerful shrewdness put an end to it. So far from pitying their wounded pride, I must add, I was moved to give it as complete a lesson as I could. They bustled about together, and got out the cups and saucers, and made the kettle boil. I knew they felt as if they were waiting on my servant, and when the tea was prepared I said, "'He'll have a cup, please. He's tired.' Mrs. Monarch brought him one where he stood, and he took it from her as if he had been a gentleman at a party, squeezing a crush hat with an elbow. Then it came over me that she had made a great effort for me, made it with a kind of nobleness, and that I owed her a compensation. Each time I saw her after this, I wondered what the compensation could be. I couldn't go on doing the wrong thing to oblige them. Oh, it was the wrong thing, the stamp of the work for which they sat. Hawley was not the only person to say it now. I sent in a large number of the drawings I had made for Rutland Ramsay, and I received a warning that was more to the point than Hawley's. The artistic adviser of the house for which I was working was of the opinion that many of my illustrations were not what had been looked for. Most of these illustrations were the subjects in which the monarchs had figured. Without going into the question of what had been looked for, I saw at this rate I shouldn't get the other books to do. I hurled myself in despair upon Miss Cherm. I put her through all her paces. I not only adopted Orante publicly as my hero, but one morning when the Major looked in to see if I didn't require him to finish a figure for the cheap side, for which he had begun to sit the week before, I told him that I had changed my mind, I would do the drawing from my man. At this my visitor turned pale and stood looking at me. "'Is he your idea of an English gentleman?' he asked. I was disappointed, I was nervous, I wanted to get on with my work, so I replied with irritation, "'Oh, my dear Major, I can't be ruined for you!' He stood another moment, then without a word he quitted the studio. I drew a long breath when he was gone for I said to myself that I shouldn't see him again. I had not told him definitely that I was in danger of having my work rejected, but I was vexed at his not having felt the catastrophe in the air, read with me the moral of our fruitless collaboration, the lesson that in the deceptive atmosphere of art even the highest respectability may fail of being plastic. I didn't owe my friends money, but I did see them again. They reappeared together three days later, and under the circumstances there was something tragic in the fact. It was a proof to me that they could find nothing else in life to do. They had threshed the matter out in a dismal conference. They had digested the bad news that they were not in for the series. If they were not useful to me even for the cheap side, their function seemed difficult to determine, and I could only judge at first that they had come, forgivingly, decorously, to take a last leave. 
This made me rejoice in secret that I had little leisure for a scene, for I had placed both my other models in position together, and I was pegging away at a drawing from which I hoped to derive glory. It had been suggested by the passage in which Rutland Ramsay, drawing up a chair to Artemisia's piano-stool, says extraordinary things to her while she ostensibly fingers out a difficult piece of music. I had done Miss Cherm at the piano before. It was an attitude in which she knew how to take on an absolutely poetic grace. I wished the two figures to compose together, intensely, and my little Italian had entered perfectly into my conception. The pair were vividly before me, the piano had been pulled out, it was a charming picture of blended youth and murmured love, which I had only to catch and keep. My visitors stood and looked at it, and I was friendly to them over my shoulder. They made no response, but I was used to silent company and went on with my work, only a little disconcerted, even though exhilarated by the sense that this was at least the ideal thing, at not having got rid of them after all. Presently I heard Mrs. Monarch's sweet voice beside or rather above me. I wish her hair was a little better done. I looked up, and she was staring with a strange fixedness at Miss Cherm, whose back was turned to her. Do you mind my just touching it? she went on, a question which made me spring up for an instant, as with the instinctive fear that she might do the young lady at harm. But she quieted me with a glance I shall never forget. I confess I should like to have been able to paint that, and went for a moment to my model. She spoke to her softly, laying a hand on her shoulder, and bending over her, and as the girl, understanding, gratefully assented, she disposed her rough curls with a few quick passes in such a way as to make Miss Cherm's head twice as charming. It was one of the most heroic personal services I have ever seen rendered. Then Mrs. Monarch turned away with a low sigh, and, looking about her as if for something to do, stooped to the floor with a noble humility, and picked up a dirty rag that had dropped out of my paint-box. The Major, meanwhile, had also been looking for something to do, and, wandering to the other end of the studio, saw before him my breakfast things, neglected, unremoved. "'I say, can't I be useful here?' he called to me, with an irrepressible quaver. I assented with a laugh that I fear was awkward, and for the next ten minutes, while I worked, I heard the light clatter of china, and the tinkle of spoons and glass. Mrs. Monarch assisted her husband, they washed up my crockery, they put it away, they wandered off into my little scullery, and I afterwards found that they had cleaned my knives, and that my slender stock of plate had an unprecedented surface. When it came over me, the latent eloquence of what they were doing. I confess that my drawing was blurred for a moment. The picture swam. They had accepted their failure, but they couldn't accept their fate. They had bowed their heads in bewilderment to the perverse and cruel law in virtue of which the real thing could be so much less precious than the unreal. But they didn't want to starve. If my servants were my models, my models might be my servants. They would reverse the parts, the others would sit for the ladies and gentlemen, and they would do the work. They would still be in the studio. It was an intense, dumb appeal to me not to turn them out. Take us on, they wanted to say. We'll do anything. When all this hung before me, the afflatus vanished. My pencil dropped from my hand. My sitting was spoiled, and I got rid of my sitters, who were also evidently rather mystified and awestruck. Then, alone with the Major and his wife, I had a most uncomfortable moment. He put their prayer into a single sentence. I say, you know, just let us do for you, can't you? I couldn't. It was dreadful to see them emptying my slops. But I pretended I could to oblige them for about a week. Then I gave them a sum of money to go away and I never saw them again. I obtained the remaining books, but my friend Hawley repeats that Major and Mrs. Monarch did me a permanent harm, got me into a second-rate trick. If it be true, I am content to have paid the price for the memory. End of chapter 4
End of The Real Thing by Henry James